you're very welcome uh, to this next lecture, lecture 2.1 on ratio analysis. Uh, in today's lecture, we're going to be looking at the formulae and we're going to do a review of a question pretty much as it would have come up in the leaving certificate. Now, before I move on to the question itself and the, the notes, one thing you would like to say about uh, the ratios question is, it's neither a compulsory nor a guaranteed question in the leaving certificate exam, but it has come up every single year as a 100 mark question since this particular syllabus was first introduced in 1997. So I think we could take it that it's a question well worth preparing, well worth knowing, and you know, students can score very well on the ratios question. Now, um, so I suppose the most important thing uh, for any student studying uh, accounting and thinking of doing the ratios question is really it's all about knowing the formulae. And you have to be very clear that you know the formulae and you know how to analyze what it means and so on. Now, in accounting, when you're doing, doing ratio analysis, the formulae, if you like, divide into five categories. You have profitability, liquidity, activity or efficiency, gearing, and the investment stroke dividend policy ratios. Now, bringing it back to the top, I suppose the cornerstone of any business is really profitability. If you're not, if a business is not profitable, it's not sustainable in the long term and a business will not last. So what do we mean by profitability? Well, it shows how well a business is performing and the return it is making on the funds that are invested in it. The most important formula um, under profitability is without any doubt, return on capital employed. And that is the formula for it is it's the operating profit divided by the capital implied, which is the total figure in the balance sheet, and multiply your answer by 100% to get your answer, which must be in, as you see here, percent. Now, to decide then whether that figure was profitable or not, you compare with risk-free investments or, and the, the, or the in interest rates from risk-free investments. Normally, we say 1% to 2%, although I suppose that figure is probably less than 1% at the moment. Now, you'd also compare it with lending rates if, you know, it was a loan required or if a company was being highly geared. Now, the second formula is, and this is really only relevant for shareholders, is return on equity. And the formula for it is profit after tax minus preference dividends over the ordinary share capital plus reserves and multiply it by 100 to get your answer as a percentage. That tells shareholders and potential shareholders, if you like, what's the percentage return that the shareholders' funds is actually making? Markup number three is the gross profit over the cost of sales by 100. Give your answer in percentage terms. And really, you would compare that with previous years or the industry average. You have the gross margin, which is gross profit over sales by 100. Answer in percent, and you compare with the previous year or the industry average. Net margin then is your net profit over sales multiplied by 100 to give your answer as a percentage, and you want it as high as possible uh, and compare with the previous year's figure. Now, what does your net profit uh, mean if you like if you're dealing with a, a set of published accounts? It really refers to your profit before tax normally. The main thing is consistency, that you apply the same figures every year if you're using the net margin. To be honest, on the profitability, the three figures that we are probably most concerned with is return on capital implied, return on equity if dealing with shareholders, and then the gross margin, which is really is a, a management figure. Because ideally speaking, uh, the gross margin, if a, company, if a company or a business is operating efficiently every year, the gross margin percentage should stay the same, regardless of how profitable a company actually is. Next category is liquidity, and this measures the ability of a business to pay its debts as they fall due. You have the current ratio or the working capital ratio, which is current assets over current liabilities, now probably known as creditors due in less than one year, and you always get your answer is to one. The generally accepted standard is it's greater than it should be greater than or equal to two is to one. The asset test ratio 
also known as the quick ratio, is your current assets less closing stock over your current liabilities. And your answer will bring it to one. And the generally accepted standard for that is uh, it should be greater or equal to one is to one. Now, like I said earlier, liquidity measures the ability of a business to pay its debts as they fall due. A business could be very profitable, but if it's not able to pay its debts as they fall due, it could become bankrupt very, very quickly. And I suppose a key word associated with a company with liquidity problems would be this question of overtrading. Then we have activity or efficiency. Now, this shows how efficiently a firm is managing its working capital. And there's three figures here, really. Stock turnover, which is your cost of sales over your average stock. And you get your answer in times. And this depends on the type of business that you're operating. Average stock is really the average of your opening and closing stock. Debtor's days is the how long does it take our customers, our credit customers, to pay us on average. And it's your debtors over the credit sales multiplied by 12. And funnily enough, your answer is given in months. Now, ideally, I suppose you want that as low as possible. Uh, because the lower it is, it means the quicker it is your customers are paying you. Number 10, your creditor's days. How long does it take our business to pay our suppliers? So it's uh, creditors over credit purchases multiplied by 12, and you give your answer in months. Now, I suppose the, the, the benchmark here really is normally you would want your, I suppose, your creditor's days uh, higher, if you like, than the debtor's days. Because what that would mean is you want you, that you have your money received from your debtors before you end up paying your own creditors. Gearing then is um, it shows the structure of a firm's long term finance. Now, capital gearing, it's your low, number 11, capital gearing, it's your loans plus preference share capital over the capital implied. And to get your answer as a percentage, multiply it by 100. And I suppose 50% is neutral gearing, anything above that is highly geared, anything below that is lowly geared. Any of you who are doing business, when you're looking at gearing in the business paper, business exam, kind of gearing is measured by the debt equity ratio, which is your loans plus preference share capital, if you like, over your ordinary share capital and reserves, which is, you know, one is to one is neutral gearing. But in accounting, it's given as a percentage of the overall capital implied. Number 12 is the interest cover, and that is your operating profit over interest, and you give your answer in times. Now, you would normally want it, you know, three or four times. The reason being, well, it would mean that, you know, you're making ample profits to cover your loan interest payments. You certainly wouldn't want a figure of one here because what that would mean is all the profits, the operating profit, if you like, has been eaten up by uh, loan interest payments. Then the investment stroke dividend policy shows if a firm is a good investment compared to other alternative opportunities. And there's a number of figures here, and it all depends on the situation. You have your earnings per share, right, which is your profit after tax minus preference dividends divided by the number of ordinary shares. And you always give your answer in cent. And ideally, I suppose you'd want to be greater than last year. That would tell you really, you know, how much the company is really earning uh, kind of on a per share basis. The dividend per share. Number 14 is your ordinary dividends divided by your number of ordinary shares. And once again, you give your answer in cent. And I suppose in an ideal world, you'd want your uh, figure higher than last year. A very important figure is the dividend cover. No matter what situation you're in or what type of question you're being asked, it's your profit after tax minus preference dividends over your ordinary dividends. Or it's, if you like, your earnings per share divided by your dividends per share. You'll always give your answer in times. And this tells a lot about a company or the company's management because, like, for example, if the uh, dividend cover was one, just for example, what it would mean is all available profits, all available profits are being paid out as dividends to the ordinary shareholders. If it was two times, well, then it would mean of the profits, you know, the earnings made by the company, it would mean, well, half is being paid out as dividends and the other half is being retained maybe for the future expansion of the company. Number 16 then is dividend yield. 
which is the dividend per share as a percentage of the market price. So it is over the market price multiplied by 100, and you give your answer as a percent. You always want that figure to be greater, substantially greater than risk-free investments because they compensate for the risk being taken, uh, you know, in a, an investment like a company. The price earnings ratio, the PE ratio, is the market price over the earnings per share, and you always give this answer in years. Now, this is a, a funny figure in the sense, normally, you kind of want it as high as possible, but you would also compare with firms in a similar industry. Um, and it kind of goes against the grain a little bit because you might imagine, well, you really, you know, if it's low, it means you will recover the market price a lot sooner. But having a high PE ratio, if you like, indicates an underlying long term conference in the company that the market price of the shares would be relatively high compared to the earnings per share. Now, this question often comes up slightly disguised. Because it's the same as asking the number of years to recoup or to recover the market price of shares at the current level of performance. And you'll see that in the question we'll be looking at now shortly. And then you have this question, I suppose, how long or what's the period to recoup the share price at current payout rate? When it says payout rate, you're looking at the dividend per share. It's the market price over the dividend per share. And that's years. And you want that to be relatively low, but you'd also compare it to last year. Now, a couple of other points in relation to the formulae. It is recommended that you always work the two places of decimals in your answers. Now, in more recent years, the examiner has actually told you to do this, but even if you weren't, you would go to two places of decimals. Always use the correct units of measurement in your answer. You know, is your answer in percent? Is it in cent? Is times, years, etc.? Otherwise, marks will be lost. Um, part of the reason I would think why some students are slow enough to do this ratios question, which surprises me in a way, is they get mixed up mixed up with the what profit figures do you use? Well, it's the you use the operating profit for two figures only, interestingly enough, for the return and capital implied and interest cover. Now, operating profit, you know from your published account, is your profit before interest and tax. The profit after tax. Less preference dividends is used for three figures, the return on equity, the dividend cover, and the earnings per share. Now, another word for the profit after tax less preference dividends, it kind of shortens it a little bit to call it earnings. That is your earnings figure. Okay? So there's your ratios. And really, if I was saying to my own students sometimes, I would say, really, there's 18 there, but you really only need to know 15 because the markup really doesn't come into it that much. The net margin doesn't really come into it that much. And if you have enough information to work out the asset test ratio or the quick ratio, you don't, the, 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 the current ratio is kind of irrelevant and I could leave it out. The other thing is when you're doing your commentary, unless you're doing your commentary for management of a company, which has never been asked, the comment, these activity figures are not relevant, you know, when you're doing your commentary. OK, now, normally in part A of a question, you will have to deal with some one of these three figures, but you know, it doesn't apply in the commentary. Now, so that's your ratios and that's your formulae. And you need to know those and how to apply them. And now we're just going to take a review of a question. Now, and the question is a typical exam paper question, really. Um, just move myself down here for a second. Yeah. Now. Um, okay, the following figures have been taken from the final account of Limerick Foods PLC, a company that produces processed foods from the agricultural sector. Always important, the sector, and you'd underline it and make sure that you take note of it, what business or what industry is the company in? The company has an authorized capital of 2 million euro, made up of 1.5 million ordinary shares of 1 euro each, and 500,000 7% preference shares at 1 euro each. Limerick Foods has already issued 800,000 ordinary shares and 200,000 preference shares. That means the issued share capital in total is 1 million. Now, how this question is presented normally is you're given an abbreviated trading and profit and loss account, you know, your sales, cost of sales, but you're not given the, the, the gross profit here. You're not told what the operating profit is. You kind of have, you have to work that out yourself. You're also given an abbreviated version of a balance sheet, you know, total for intangible assets, tangible assets, the current assets, the current liabilities or creditors due within one year, 
And then you're given the market value of one ordinary share at the end of the current year 2020. And then you're given relevant information in relation to what happened with this company last year. You know, the quick ratio, the return on capital employed, the return on equity funds. Now, this box, if you like, is often a good indication of the figures that you might need to, co to compute for this year. But it's not absolute. You have to use the ones that are also relevant, you know, when you're doing your commentary. Now, so you were required then, and part day of the question, like very often in this case is 45 marks, but very often is 50 marks. And to me, it's the easiest 50 marks that you will pick up on the Leaving Cert Accounting exam, and you can do it very quickly, provided you know your formula. In this case, you were asked to calculate the following for 2020. The earnings per ordinary share, the cash sales if the average period of credit given to debtors is 1.5 months, the dividend yield on ordinary shares, the gearing ratio, how long it would take one ordinary share to recover or to recoup is 2020 market price based on current performance. Now, I referred to that just earlier. This is where students sometimes make a mistake. Do you use, if you like, um, the price earnings ratio or do you take the market price over the dividend per share? If it says current performance, that means you use the price earnings figure or the price earnings formula. Now, a few extra questions for your own practice that you might have done before the next lecture is to work out what is the interest cover? What is the return on capital employed? The return on equity funds? The gross margin? And what must the stock turnover be if the opening stock was 50,000 euro? And that's part A, but all you'd have for part A normally are five parts like you see up here in this top section. Now, the next section then, I'll just move myself up here, is advise a friend of yours who has been given the opportunity to buy ordinary shares in Limerick Foods PLC, but before doing so, ask your opinion. What advice would you give? Use relevant ratios, percentages, and any other information from the above to support your answer. So you're doing this analysis, I suppose, from the point of view of a potential shareholder. And then part C, which there normally is, outline three of the main users of financial statements of limited companies in your answer, explain why the user has an interest in such accounts. Now, in the next lecture 2.2, I'll be going through the solution to part A, but I'll also be going through what I think is very valuable information on how to approach the question. So for the moment, thank you for watching this uh, great academy lecture. And you might have a go at those questions, and I'll see you in lecture 2.2. And in the meantime, happy learning. Thank you.